Pinnacle is the world's sharpest sports book and is now available in Ontario. Find out what professional bettors have known for decades. Pinnacle is where the bettors play, taking sharp action every day. No limits, low synthetic hold, and a must-have for those with a top-down approach. Must be 19 plus in Ontario. Please play responsibly. Not available in the United States. On this week's episode of 90 Degrees, we are joined by the promo guy, Sportsbook Promo Advantage Player. You could find the promo guy on Twitter at the promo guy 123. Today we're talking about how he beats sportsbook promos, bad beat refunds, and the shift in sportsbook advertising. Let's dive into the sharp side and look at the right angles in sports bet. Big bomb bomb bangers. Boogie down. Ladies and gentlemen, Jews and gentlemen, bangers, sharps and squares. Welcome back to episode 21 of 90 Degrees, the show where we discuss the right betting angles. I'm your host, Kevin Davis, and today we're bringing on the promo guy. Welcome to the show. How's it going? Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate you having me on. Everything's great. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good myself, getting ready to hit some of these promos. Uh, Why don't you tell our listeners... uh, how you occupy uh, the sports betting space. Yeah, so basically I do the math behind uh, promotions and boosts that, you know, the major sports books post, so DraftKings, FanDuel, sometimes Caesars. And really the idea behind it is betting markets are relatively efficient. You know, the, the lines that you see are reflective of the true implied probabilities that events will happen. And I do the math, so I convert those odds into implied probabilities and tell people which boosts and promos to play and really optimize, especially for the promo plays, what is the best way to play this, to maximize whether it's the insurance or the free bet or you know whatever the promo comes with. I try and maximize the best I can for people following me. Yeah, I came across your profile and was really impressed because most of the uh, sports promo content doesn't do any math. It's just basically tied to affiliates where the purpose is getting people to sign up for the sports book so they can make money. Whereas your content, you'll talk about the bad boosts and you'll talk about the good boosts and you'll do some math behind it. Now, when did you first, you know, start betting sports promos yourself? Was it when it came to New Jersey or before then? So I was actually in Philly uh, and now I'm in New York, but I was in Philly during uh, the pandemic and I started doing it probably basically during COVID. So mid to late 2020, I was betting the boost and promos myself. And then at some point, I guess it was April, 2021, I was like, you know, I've been making all this money, having a lot of fun with it. So people should know about these boosts and promos and, you know, I looked at on Twitter and all the replies to sports books were like another trap, another terrible promo. I'm like, wait, these are awesome. Like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> so uh, I really wanted to just help people understand which ones to take. And it was really just a fun thing that I was doing that then I could share with, you know, with others. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible that people are like, this is a trap, but the whole purpose of the promo is to get people betting so then they'll make other bets and then lose their money back uh do you ever get in trouble for only doing promos like how do you uh make sure that your promos don't get limited yeah i think that especially with smaller sports books uh they really struggle if you know like your accounts will, will get limited if you are only betting boosts and promos i think for the FanDuel, DraftKings, Caesars of the world, kind of the bigger books, they treat it a lot more as, you know, FanDuel just hit 50% market share in the US, right? Like they are trying to be the sports betting book for everyone. And they're not concerned if you're taking them for, you know, one $50, 10% EV boost is $5 a day, right? They're not, they're not sweating that a tremendous amount. I think you can, for the most part, bet boosts and promos on, say, FanDuel. Uh, and you will, you probably won't get limited. And then Caesars and DraftKings to, to a certain extent, especially Caesars, 
kind of operate similarly. I would say that where they're really trying to limit are people who are getting tremendous CLV, you know, closing line value on bigger bets. They're hitting glitches. They're arbing. People that maybe are hitting for more money and taking money that maybe is unintended for them to take, right? So FanDuel is putting out a promo because they want people to do it. Dinger Tuesday is a great example where literally everyone on gambling Twitter is betting home runs on Tuesdays because of the promo. They're okay if you are betting dingers on Tuesday because of the promo. What they're not okay with is the money you take sort of unintentionally. And they have ways of tracking that, like closing line value uh, is just you know one example of, of a way you can get yourself limited. And, and a lot of that really just means arbing because they can tell when you're arbing for the most part. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the arbing is easy to catch because – you know, they'll see like a spike in your betting pattern. Yeah. And they know what the odds are everywhere else. Yeah. And you're not the only one, you know, you're, you're, you're on uh, one of these odds jam type sites and you and 500 other people are, are being the same exact random tennis line at the same time that you would never normally bet. It's obvious. And you're usually betting in weird amounts. Like they're not, you're not betting. $200, $200, you're betting $263 to match your payout on the other sports book <laughs> uh, perfectly. So I think it's kind of obvious. Uh, the way I like to think about limiting is you have to imagine that there's a human trader. I mean, they obviously have their metrics that can get you limited, but imagine a human trader is looking at your bets. Does it look like you are super sharp, trying to take advantage of them, hitting glitches, things of that nature? Or are you just a regular better? And sometimes you bet promos, sometimes you bet money lines, you're betting SGPs, you know, whatever it is, more of a, yeah, maybe I make some money, but I'm innocent in all of this. And I think that those are the people that survive a lot longer with their accounts. Yeah, definitely. I mean, points bet is notorious for promo limiting, but they've like changed their promo game big time. Were you ever around for when points bet had the really good promos? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they, unless there's a time well before my time that you're referring to, but I think you're just talking about they used to be a lot better. And I, I think a lot of these smaller type books, and maybe that some of this does go back to FanDuel hitting 50% market share in the US, of they are just struggling and they're trying to be profitable with the customers they do have because they're not going to be able to get every customer out there. They're not going to be the number one sports book in, in a given state. And I think that that's where you see smaller players either either leaving the market or limiting a lot harsher. I mean, it is hard not to get limited on points bet and be making make consistently smart bets. It just is. So I don't I, you know that's also that's partially why my Twitter account doesn't focus on books like that. You know, Sports Illustrated, Hard Rock. Yeah, you, know, you can you can name them all. Like if if. I don't want to be a source of getting you limited and I'm not going to be tracking profits that either I can't get or that you can't get because you're limited. So that's kind of why I focus on the bigger books who are more welcoming of the action. And they're trying to be more of the Amazons of this world where they'll, they'll give you a, a couple bucks a day, 10 bucks, 15, $20 a day uh, just to have you around, have you on the, the app, have you telling your friends about it, things like that, and hope that they make it back, you know, in other ways. Yeah, I mean, points bet, this was in late 2019. And they were offering three dollars in three in free bets for every three pointer hit if you bet a hundred dollars on the spread. Yeah, Barstool had the same exact promo, actually. And then they were doing like they had other ridiculous promos and Bruce boosts. So I didn't know anything about the sports betting industry. So I was just hitting these all. And then I got like the threatening email about how we're not accusing you of fraud, but we're worried about it. And yeah, you I might mean, be limited. We recommend 10% of your action on promos. I did the 10% of my action and I still got limited. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Especially for them. Um. Do the sports books ever contact you directly and be like, hey, we don't like what you're doing or we like what you're doing or do they just leave you alone? Uh, I don't I don't speak to the sports books too often. 
uh, usually they, you know, they're pretty responsive to me if I DM them and they'll, you know, if there's confusion with a promo or there's something that kind of needs to be answered, I can kind of get their attention and be like, Hey, you might want to look at this or what did you mean by eight runs in the baseball game? Does that mean it wins on a tie or loses on a tie or pushes like what would, you know, that kind of stuff. And they'll usually be pretty responsive and pretty friendly to me in that sense. Uh, so that's really the only communication I have. I don't think there's really any need to talk to them more than that. Again, I really just focus on the bigger books on the Twitter account. So it's all pretty friendly. Sometimes I give one of them a hard time if they're pulling lines too quickly, uh, like DraftKings the other day with the risk-free SGPs. Like most people have $10 SGP bets on this, you really need to pull your entire SGP because a couple of people bet a ten dollar bet. Like it's a ten dollar bet at plus three twenty. You can handle it. Uh I mean I'll do the ten dollar bet SGP and get limited to two dollars and thirty two cents. Well, separate issue. You you can't get ten dollars on any bet. But what I'm saying is they don't need to pull the entire SGP function just because a few people hit that bet. But Otherwise, other than giving a hard time, it's a pretty positive relationship in the sense that they clearly are aware. And honestly, it's it's nice to see that they're seemingly increasingly welcoming promo action in the sense that, you know, you have these flash pick promos, you have sort of this continued stream of promos that maybe some people didn't think would continue up, up until this point. And I think, honestly, they just recognize that it's a really good way to fend off the exchanges that are coming to fend off the smaller books. It's cheaper marketing wise than, you know, having the whole Manning family on a TV ad, right? Like the if you want, field goal. Yeah. If you want to get people on your app and betting, give them financial incentive too. And I think that they've learned that as long as you put $25 max bet, $50 max bet on the promo is sometimes smaller. Uh, people don't, they still want to do it. They still have fun betting it and they're going to be engaged in your book. And there's no better example of that than FanDuel who has had Dinger Tuesday the last few years, which is the best promo around. They've consistently, almost almost 350 days a year, they have a, you know, quote, must bet odds boost. And, they, you know, look at their market share numbers. They keep going up. Whereas the other books and DraftKings has really stepped it up recently and Caesars has kind of come back into the market, but they have not been consistently giving out high EV promos the way that FanDuel has over the last year. During baseball season, they went completely quiet while FanDuel had Dinger Tuesday going on. And I think this stuff matters. And I think that these sports books are realizing that it matters and that we might not go the way of Europe where it's about having the tightest lines. Maybe it's more important to have promos and refunds and exotic bets like SGPs, stuff like that, that are really what the U.S. better cares about. How do you feel about bad beat refunds? I always kind of say the same thing. I don't ask for them. We're not owed them. I mean, we, we, made, we made a bet just because it was a promotional one doesn't really change that. But I really struggle to understand why people hate them. <laughs> like, okay, you don't want to see whining on Twitter, don't go on Twitter, right? But at the end of the day, they are taking their marketing budget and they're putting it in betters' hands instead of putting it in their own pockets. Like whoever is rooting for the sports book to keep the money instead of giving it back to the people, it's, it's a hard thing to kind of relate to. So I look at it just like anything else. It's promotion for them it's marketing for them and at the right time it makes a lot of sense to do but it's not like they owe us because anthony davis got hurt right anthony davis could always get hurt and i'm never going to ask but i always give them their flowers when they do i always retweet it or I always say hey awesome move by them just because well i want them to do it i want them to put money in your pockets in my pockets as opposed to keep it so i like that it happens but obviously i'm not gonna ever ask for it or expect it because 
we didn't make the bet with the thought in mind that if our guy gets hurt, that we're going to get our money back. Yeah, I mean, I have mixed feelings because I think part of it is the point of the promo should be to get people betting. So if they've already made the bet, you know, you got to put injury as part of the calculus. But on the other hand, you know, they're making a business decision that it works for them. And the, the free PR they get is worth more than the paid PR in many of the cases. So it makes sense business wise, but I'm kind of indifferent to it. You know, I think if I were a sports book, I would consider giving a loss back where regardless of what you bet on, if somebody lost a bunch of money, you get an email saying, Hey, we see you had a bad month. We're giving you a hundred dollars bet. However you want. Yeah. I mean, I think there are probably, if I had to guess, sort of like gambling addiction concerns with that. And people would probably be up in arms about, oh, they're only looking out for their problem gamblers or, oh, don't worry if you lose a bunch of money, we'll give you some of it back. Keep betting. Don't worry. Kind of a deal. But anything that puts money in gamblers' pockets, uh, I'm never going to be against. I mean, I think the bigger concerns for gambling addiction or the advertising it's not the the people who are already gambling let uh you know giving a little nudge i think the bigger concerns are the people who have stopped gambling and are trying not to log into their app but they can't watch um you know real housewives with their girlfriend without seeing five bet mgm casino ads you're, you're like or whatever people who don't gamble do <laughs> um well, no, because my yes. girlfriend watches it because, like, what I watch, I always get the sports betting ads. My girlfriend will watch Housewives, and then we'll see BetMGM Casino. Yeah, no, I agree. It's unavoidable. I feel bad for anyone that's battled with gambling addiction in the past because they really don't make it easy. You know, there if you have a drug addiction in the past, there aren't – I'm not saying it's easy to avoid, but – there aren't billboards saying come do heroin, you know, everywhere. Right. And we don't even have cigarette world, billboards. Right. It's, and I mean, obviously there are, there's alcohol everywhere, but it's the same, it's the same kind it's the same kind of deal where it's, it's impossible to avoid. And especially with Kevin Hart, uh, you know, on the heart of Madison square garden saying, Oh my God, I have, $200 in free bets just jumping into my account. Yeah, if I were if I had a gambling addiction, I'd be like, "Oh my god, I want 200." You know, how could you not be incentivized by that? So, it's tough. And I just I mean, that's not going away. That kind of adds, but it's uh it's sort of the the negative to legalize gambling in the US, right? I mean, it becomes a lot harder to deal with that addiction. You you can bet a lot of money just on your cell phone. I mean, I think the one thing with the United States that makes them different than other industrialized countries is the First Amendment protections make it so it's harder for state governments or federal governments to regulate the advertising. Whereas like the tobacco advertising got limited because of a lawsuit. Like ultimately it's going to be, it's going to take somebody really powerful having a loved one losing, you know, all their money, sports betting, and then there's going to be an awful crackdown that affects these promos. <laughs> well, That's my prediction. I, you know, I can't, I can't speak to any of that and, and don't really have a good sense for, you know, regulations on advertisements or whether like, you know, gambling should or shouldn't be legal. You know, that's not for me to decide or, or to honestly think much about. Ultimately, I think that the promos aren't, the overly addicting part of gambling. And there's certainly not where you're going to lose all, all, all your money, especially if you're someone who's rich and powerful. So I think that, I just think that the overall move from sports books towards promotions where it might be cheaper on a dollar basis versus the efficacy of people getting on the app and betting is where like this whole thing is seemingly being driven to. I mean, when New York first legalized, there were 5X, it seems, the amount of ads there are today. 
but the promos are about the same other than like the the new user promo type things and i think a lot of that speaks to they are sports books are finding it more effective to run a dinger tuesday promotion than it is to have a commercial with with the mannings for the same cost let's say i notice a lot of these boosted odds like if you go line shopping at other sites, the non-boosted price will be better than the boosted price. I mean, isn't that somewhat deceptive to call it a boost when it's not boosted at all? It might yeah. be even reduced. <laughs> yeah, I've seen I've seen boosts that are worse than their own sportsbooks sites, where they just change around like a player's points and assists a little bit, so it's hidden that it's actually worse. But if you look at the equivalent odds that it would be versus their mainline odds, it's clearly worse. I saw that the other day. Uh, so I think that there's definitely a lot of deception. And I think that overall, sports books use promotions in different ways. Some people are a little bit more upfront about it, where they're like, we view this as promotional. It's part of our marketing budget. We're happy if you come win some money as long as you stick around on our app. Other sports books use it as, hey, we're going to further incentivize you to bet. We're going to call it boosted, but we're just trying to get you to bet more negative EV bets than you might have otherwise. Because see, people see a boost on a bet they like, and they're like, hey, this is probably at least the best odds I can get out there, if not plus EV on its own. You know, They don't know. They're, they're not calculating it or anything. And they're like, man, I really like Jokic tonight. So I'll take a boost on Jokic's points and assists, even if it's – terrible even if it's worse than other sports books have for his points and assists and that's really where it's some that's where really where it is deceptive because it's not a boost and they're just calling it a boost to get you to make more bets on their app now have you ever considered uh working for a sports book developing uh boosts and promos no uh i would say I guess there's kind of two parts to that for me where one, I don't think it would be the most interesting thing to do in the world. I mean, all they're really doing is picking, I mean, the NBA boost on FanDuel tonight, I can probably guess it's going to be like two of the star players to combine for 50 points, 60 points, or two of the star players or three star players to each get 25 plus points, right? Like they're just doing popular bets and boosting them. They're, they're, taking stuff that people want to watch and boost them. I don't think I'd be much better than whoever has it already. And I don't think that that's really a role for like a very quantitative person is coming up with the boost and promos. As far as working for a sports book in general, like as a trader type thing, I was already a trader like on Wall Street doing, you know, I, I left that to do this. I'd rather, I'd rather help put money in people's pockets than like, find creative ways to con people out of money. Uh, not that that's what we were doing at the bank by any stretch, but I guess what I'm saying is like, I'd rather, I'd rather work for the people than for the sports book. I've already, I already did that for years and, and really enjoyed it, but I would just go back there if I was going to do something, if I was going to be a trader, I'd rather go be a trader on wall street than be a trader for a sports book. I mean, the crazy thing is for people who've interviewed for the jobs where they're coming up with the promotions and marketing material, the the hiring teams never ask the people if they actually bet on sports themselves. It's always like a standard look at the resume, but they they do nothing to ask, you know, if you know the subject matter or if you yeah, even use the I mean, app. People, people, sometimes people, uh, you know, like haters of promo guy and EV betting, uh, would probably say that they, they find the sharpest people in the world to come up with the boosts and promos because, you know, they're, they're figuring out exactly what's going to lose and then they're boosting it. But uh, I agree. I think, I, I mean, I don't think it's really an issue. I think there's nothing wrong with just boosting parlays that, you know, people are betting anyway is essentially what they do. Like every night it's Tatum, LeBron and Steph to each have 25 plus points like that's probably a popular bet out there and then they just boost it and it's because 
if they're going to boost odds, they're, they're not going to boost like ping pong or odds. unders or unders. They're going to boost stuff that like everybody's going to watch and have as much fun with as possible. They want their, their marketing dollars to go as far as they can. And for you to watch LeBron, Steph and Tatum tonight and root for their points is kind of ideal for them, right? They're not, they're not, they're not going to boost Derek White under 17 and a half points, the plus 120. Like, who cares? <laughs> it's not as sexy of a bet. Now, how much of your actual betting or betting advice you give on the Discord is not related to boosts? Um, so, I mean, a lot of it's boosts and promos. Some of it is like uh, SGP betting. I do like correlation stuff. So I don't know about percentages because so so much of the boosts and promos that are on the Discord are either smaller books because people want promo plays for Hard Rock and Bet Rivers and Barstool and so on and so forth. And then a lot of it's also like VIP on these different books and some of the more targeted stuff, state specific, Michigan and Arizona, like, you know, whatever, whatever state you are in giving promo plays for, for those ones, for those people. Uh, so I would say that a lot of it ends up being promotions and boosts just because of the sheer amount, sheer quantity of boosts and promos that are out there. If you look at every book and every state specific thing that you can find, it ends up being a lot of prize picks and all that too. So I would say, I guess a lot of it is boost and promos, but I also do a lot of like, I call them plus EV SGPs. Uh, last year I did like pure handicapping college football picks. So th there ends up being a decent variety. And, you know, I end up, I work pretty hard and spend a lot of time on the discord. So I try and put out as much value as there I can find out there. But overall, I think most of it still ends up coming down to boosts and promos just because of the increasing quantity of boosts and promos that are out there it's, it's amazing that it's increasing because so many of these books have now, you know now FanDuel is dropping random targeted boosts in people's accounts for college basketball for nba for nhl there's one today and so many people don't get them but people still want plays for them it's not really an appropriate place to put on my twitter account because then my twitter would just be blasted with a bunch of stuff that people don't care about or have picks for but the people who do have these picks still want them. So that, that's kind of where the Discord fits in perfectly. Uh, as well as some of this stuff, like I actually created the disc, I created a Discord. It wasn't paid. The, the entry fee was charity at the time because I was still with my job. But I created it because during Dinger Tuesday, my account was basically too big. And every time I posted a Dinger Tuesday pick, the line would move legitimately within 30 seconds where I was... I was no longer providing value to my followers by posting. It was useless. I stopped mid midway through the week at one point, you know, by the last week. Moved it to the Discord, moved perfectly smooth, and, 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 and it did last year as well. And that's kind of where, like, I always want my posts, whether it's Twitter, Discord, wherever, to be of value to people. And that's where it's been kind of a nice balance where the Twitter can be here are the must bets that everybody's got. You know, you've got such and such 25% college basketball parlay on Caesars. You've got a DraftKings risk-free SGP. You've got a FanDuel boost and a FanDuel promo. Like this is what everyone has. These are the must bets here, the best plays for them. Or I'm just recommending which ones to play. And then the Discord can be everything else. It can be, here's all the other EV under the sun that is not available to everyone. It's either only available to these two states or it's you have to be a VIP on this book, so on and so forth. Uh, I hope that answered your question. I mean, because you said the Discord is only $15 a month. So it seems like a lot of people will make that back in bets. Yeah, there, there are different tiers to it, but... Yeah, I mean, our, the retention is very high. I think it's 91%. I'd have to go back and check, but it's something like that. So, you know, people stick around once they're they're in. I would say that the only downside to it, I mean, obviously, 
you have up and down lines. But the only like kind of long term downside to it is you just have to be kind of committed and into the EV stuff. You don't have to do it every day, but you know, you have to be sort of on it. You know, you get the notification, you place the bet, you move on with your life, but you have to have four different sports books or three different sports books, whatever. You have to pay attention to your state specifics, stuff like that. I mean, if you are an engaged EV better, you really don't leave it. The people that do leave, you know, the 9% that, that do end up leaving, they usually just say like, you know, I'm okay with my one FanDuel boost a day, my one DraftKings risk-free SGP, and I, I move on with my life. Like, I, I don't care that I can be making all this money on Barstool and Bet Rivers or with these SGP, you know, whatever, right? Like, they're not as actively engaged in every single part of EV betting, and they're just okay with their two to three picks a day on Twitter. Now, you brought up the haters, and obviously you can't be in the gambling community without haters. Uh, it's not a community known for uh, modesty a lot of the time. Uh, what type of criticisms do they have and what's your response? It's a good question. I would say that the the haters have actually gone down. I mean, I can't I don't have like numbers to to stand you know stand by that. but I think early on in the account, a lot of people were really against the idea. I mean, even a promo as, you know, stupidly obvious as like Dinger Tuesday, people were like, oh yeah, betting on home runs is a is a good way to, to make money long term, like clown emoji, whatever, right? Uh, and I think a lot of people just didn't believe in it. Or the booster traps was was kind of a frequent that's still out there. But I think even a lot of the people that were very heavy on booster traps either gave up on it or it's just it's been long enough, the data tracks long enough where it's just kind of obvious that it, it it works. So the haters have been pretty quiet. I mean, obviously, like any capper, if I go through a down stretch, there are some not nice comments, but it's overwhelmingly positive, to be honest. Like people are really appreciative that I take the time to figure these out. Uh, they're appreciative of promo plays. You know, people all the time are like, you know, I would, try and put something together myself, but yours will probably be better. And I don't want to spend 10, 15 minutes finding an optimal play. Right. So over, it's overwhelmingly positive, uh, probably increasingly so versus how, it, how it was. I, I still get a lot of the, Oh my God, Jason Tatum got hurt. And of course he was in a fan duel boost. And to that, I say, or, or Anthony Davis got hurt. Like people You say actually, he's an athlete. People were actually like, I can't believe Anthony Davis got hurt the one day he's in a FanDuel boost. I'm like, you have not paid any attention to Anthony Davis <laughs> over the last 10 years, right? He gets hurt when he's not in a FanDuel boost too. But, I mean, overall, like, they're not doing anything. So they think it's a conspiracy the sports books are in on? Yeah, that they, that they know a guy's banged up or that they call a guy at half for him to to go down with an injury like that kind of a deal i think that part of the reason why some of that is maybe less intense than it was is because the boosts have almost gotten simpler in the sense that it really is just especially for like nba it's just star players to do well so you can't say the one time anthony davis is in a or lebron james is in a fanduel boost he's in a fanduel boost like twice a week of course he's going to get hurt at some point and or maybe before it was a little bit more all over the place a little bit more random it's become increasingly just star players to perform same thing with the nfl a lot of the boosts this year were on fanduel were such and such star quarterback to get 200 passing yards and their team to win and when you put it simply and consistently like that you, it's not like in the conference championship they boosted Patrick Mahomes' passing yards because they thought he wasn't going to have a good passing yard game. They boosted his passing yards every single game. <laughs> sometimes he's going to go over, sometimes he's going to go under, but he's not like in their pockets for his whole career. I mean, I figured uh, the, your criticism would have been uh, that people like the sharp book model more that Pinnacle uses, for example where it's all about having low vigorish 
accepting winners, moving on action. Whereas you're kind of, you know, the promos are part of the recreational sports book world. Now, I personally, you know, now have a position on it. I think if I were running a sports book, I would offer promos with a low dollar limit just because it keeps people engaged. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm not a sports book that is, I'm not a sports book, period, but I, I'm not the one offering the promos. I'm just helping people take advantage of them. So I think that, and I don't really receive this criticism, but you sort of see the criticism uh, amongst like the sharp Twitter world, whatever that means, of, oh, these refunds are terrible. These promotions are terrible. This isn't gambling. This isn't how a sports book should be run. But not to come after anybody, but like, this is what the U.S. wants. This is what U.S. bettors want. They don't want minus 102 lines. They want minus 110 lines that they can SGP together and have a perfect game script for 28 to 1. It just is. And they and they want refunds when one of those guys gets hurt. And they want these promotions and stuff. And, it, you know, I think there's a reason why – whatever, I don't, I, this isn't calling them out. It's like the numbers, but like Circus Sportsbook has, I think, a 0.7% market share. So it's re something really low. Maybe it's like 1% market share in Iowa. They, they run- Oh, even in Iowa. Iowa. I thought you meant like overall. No, no, like no. Like, not in many the state, like in the States, they're in. Uh, and it's a really great sportsbook. People love it in Vegas. They, they offer really great pricing. I use it all the time as sort of a benchmark. Uh, and the same goes for Pinnacle, but they're not in the US, so I don't have that data. And it's not a shot at them, but people would much prefer be on DraftKings, FanDuel, and Caesar. So, so, you know, say what you want about how these sports books are operating, but when given the choice, it's what it's what U.S. betters kind of proven to want. So, I don't really understand that. You know, I understand that it might not be the way everybody wants it because very small percentage of people get limited. I mean, it's got to be less than 1% of people are like truly limited on FanDuel. And sure, to that less than 1%, they might prefer Circus Sports, who doesn't offer SGPs. They don't offer exotic stuff. They don't do promotions. They don't do refunds. It's, it's largely money lines and totals. And you can bet more on it than you could on another book. That's just not what most bettors are doing. David Purdom had a great stat, the ESPN guy. It was like one one game where points bet had more action on some running backs, yards or attempts, some some you know rushing stat than they had on their team's money line in the game. It's That's just bizarre. an increase bizarre. But it, especially because it's, it's points bet. Well, whatever. It, 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 you know. Or uh, like they would be taking that much more on a player prop than a money line. I, I hear you. You know, I, I'd have to go back and look at the exact stat. I think I'm remembering it right, though. And I mean, I it believe just it's just that, crazy. Yeah, it just shows that, like, that's what that's what betters want. And if you can offer exotic SGP bets where you're willing to take, you know, correlation risks that Circa's not, and you're you offer some promos and you offer some refunds and you put out a bunch of player props, even if you're exposing yourself to a ton of action on some guys rushing attempts that you'll get rewarded with market share. And I think it's kind of hard to criticize, like giving people what they want. Yeah. I mean, these SGPs, uh, you know, uh, profit boosts are insane because I can just it's, take, it's, it's what every promo is. I could take Every an insane promo player. These days are parlays. Yeah. But mostly SGPs. It's because that's what they want. That's what people want to bet. And it's also what they want people betting. So well, it's, it's mainly is what they want people play. betting. Correct. But, but they wouldn't. And they want they people to hit one so they get addicted. Every promo wouldn't be an SGP promo if nobody wanted to bet SGPs. So it's, it's both. I mean, it's crazy for these SGP promos where you can build your own SGP. And I just take a star player and all the unders and just like wait to get for them to get injured. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mr. Over Under, the guy on Twitter was like famous for those a while back. I think that they, they lowered the odds a bit. But you know what? 
it, I think ultimately when it comes to SGPs, people have a game script in mind of what's going to happen. So they picture the Patriots going up early and then running the ball. So they'll take Patriots to win, Patriots first half, such and such running back, you know, the Patriots running back overs, the quarterback passing yards under because they're going to stop passing in the second half and, you know, whatever on the other team, you know, the other team is running back overs and you end up with like seven legs for really high odds because the game has to go exactly the way you picture it. But that's how they think it's going to go. And they're like, oh my God, for 40 to one, the game just going how I think it's going to go. That's awesome. Now I propose an idea on Twitter that nobody, not I shouldn't say nobody, but most people said was an awful idea. Okay. Like you go to McDonald's. I'll try and be kind then. You go to McDonald's and they tell you how many calories are in a hamburger or chicken McNuggets. But you go to a sports book and it doesn't tell you the house edge, but you can look it up for uh, like, um, you know, single wagers or parlays. But for SGPs, you have no way of knowing what their edge is. So my proposal was for every single SGP, as you build it, for them to tell you the house edge, just like they do on a slot machine. And so people would still bet them, but at least the consumer would be informed. Yeah, I've mentioned this in the past, but I mean, the sports books would obviously not want that. Uh, Betters honestly might not want that, but. The I sports books that, don't want any regulation, period. They want right. low taxes think, and to be do whatever they want. I think coming from the financial industry, which is so incredibly regulated, especially from a trading seat, where I was dealing with extraordinarily sophisticated, you know, let's say hedge funds that were trading with me. And, you know, I was a market maker, so I was making two way prices, similar to how a sports book makes it, like minus 110 each way or minus 120 plus 100, you know, th- that kind of deal. It was obviously not priced in those terms, but, you know, relating it back to betting. And you had to tell them, you know, the fair, the fair middle for each of them, you had to, to you know, uh, they had to tell you the second best price that was out there. I had to do trainings every single day, it felt like, to make sure that I was as communicative and understanding uh, that I of every right that basically this hedge fund that was trying to rip my head off <laughs> uh, had. And then you move over to the betting space and sportsbooks tell you nothing. I mean, I was telling hedge funds like, you know, this is what's happening in the market. This is how we see it. This is how other banks are pricing it. This is what we think is going to, like you had to tell them any info that was out there. And now here they, they tell you nothing. They limit you kind of willy nilly. They don't tell you the edge. They don't tell you the fair odds. They don't give you basically, can you imagine them telling you the fair odds on every price? That's, that's what I used to do. I used to give them the fair odds. And then I would do my two way. And I just think that the betting space should have a a lot of these regulations, probably more so than the financial industry, because, you know, in order to be dealing with whether you're a big insurance company or a hedge fund, whatever, to be trading with a, you know, Wall Street investment bank, you have to be very sophisticated. You have large systems and smart, you know, like whatever educated uh, i don't know what the right word here is but like it was a very sophisticated market and you couldn't just bet it from your living room or trade it from your living room whereas in the betting space anyone with a phone and a social security number can put these bets in and yet they're told nothing they're given no information they are basically given no limits on how much they can bet especially if they are losing customers And they can kind of drain themselves dry. And all they're given is call 1-800-GAMBLER, right? Like, okay, that's not nearly enough of what to do in order to have an informed trade, an informed bet. So I think that the regulations in this industry are incredibly light. I think that problems in the trading world and the financial industry got us to a point of this intense regulation. And I just don't want to see it 
you know, you kind of like you mentioned before, a bunch of people losing all their money for it to happen in this industry. Uh, so I do like your idea. I think that the more information you can give someone, the more education. Pinnacle deserves a lot of credit for all the education that they do. Of making sure people are educated when they put their money on something. Because, yeah, sure, it's not billions and whatever of dollars that are being wagered or traded or traded like they are in the financial industry. But to each individual person, it it's an equivalent. Right. If you're betting, if some average person's betting a thousand dollars in a week or a month or whatever, that's the same as so and so large insurance company placing a billion dollars of trades. It's the same thing. It's just proportional to the amount of money that you're kind of dealing with. So it's shocking to me coming from that world into this one where there should again, I think there should be a lot more regulation in this world than there is in that one. I mean, eventually it's going to bite betters in the ass because they're already like proposing laws that don't even like hit the right parts of the industry. It's only the advertising and banning risk-free bets or any promos (laughs) rather than nobody talking about SGPs. There's nobody talking about these bets that drain more out of a player's bank account than the bets that were popular pre-legalization. It was a tricky thing because of how high the taxes are in the industry you know, for the sports books. They're like, well, if we can't make money off of SGPs for people, like we're just not going to show up. So they're like, it's kind of a tricky thing on their part. But I, I still think you can educate people and people will put money down without tricking them. But, you know, I guess it gets a little political there. I just struggle to understand why a very sophisticated hedge fund that has more resources than we probably did or do at, at, you know, the investment bank and the investment bank would be like the sports book in this case, why they get more protections, more educations, more regulations than some random guy in his living room who, you know, just looked up what minus 110 means. Like why, why is that person being less protected than the the hedge fund is? (laughs) I mean, it's one crazy. simple answer is the guy betting minus 110 in the living room doesn't have a powerful lobby behind him. But the sports books have a powerful lobby and there's a problem gambler lobby, but there's there's no actual gambler lobby themselves that the state legislatures go to. Yes, that or we're just in the, the 1980s version that Wall Street was in when there were a lot less regulations. You know, 2008 changed a lot for the financial industry because of loose you know a lot of people argued a lot of it fair and accurate that loose regulations contributed to a lot of some of the issues in 2008 so let's have a bunch of regulations well we're not going to have an economic collapse because people don't know what they're betting but there should be some catalyst for increased regulations in this industry absolutely I mean, the crazy thing is I watched that Hulu um, docudrama, Dope Sick. And I I was watching people getting addicted to OxyContin and the companies marketing it and then becoming heroin addicts. And I thought, you know, we could have something like this happen in the gambling industry. Because we don't know what sort of research they have on how truly addicting some of their products are. Yeah, I think... I mean, and addiction is obviously a big problem, but I think some of, I think what we're speaking to more is the lack of education around people should just know what they're do, what they're betting. And addiction is almost a secondary issue. I mean, it's never a secondary issue, but it's almost a secondary issue in the sense of first, make sure people understand what they're betting. Make sure they understand there's more vegan parlays. Make sure they understand that 40 to one maybe should be 60 to one. And then let them say, okay, I get it. It should be 60 to one, but I want the 40 to one chance. This is how I think the game's going to go. And then there's no issue. Then you can, then we can talk about completely separately the issues with addiction because regulations, at least the ones that we're talking about, aren't going to help with addiction. They're going to help with education. 
which might make people lose money less quickly, but, or just be at least be informed of what they're doing. You know, it, it kind of reminds me of the NFL where, you know, these, I mean, and the NFL was much more extreme, but like guys didn't know that these head injuries were going to cause lifelong problems for them. People still play NFL, playing the NFL and they know it. And honestly, most people don't have an issue anymore. Like, okay, if you know, as a whatever position player, you might get CTE later and you still choose to play, nobody's feeling bad for you anymore. It's kind of the same thing with gambling. Like if you choose to bet $110 to win 100, fully understanding that that's what you're betting. Because I've seen people get confused about, you know, the the payout wager or the risk-free bets about, you know, what you, what you're actually getting back and what the returns are. Uh, or Fox bet. I love that when they do double your money when it's plus 100, right? It implies plus 200. Stuff like that. That's kind of the stuff I'd like to see regulated more just to have more of an educational component to this. All right. Do you have any last words for our guest today on promos or anything else? I hope we have a great NCAA tournament. Yeah, me too. I and, hope we uh, have a lot of great boosts. Absolutely. It'll be fun. You know, last year was kind of a insane run that I 99.5% whatever will not replicate. But we can have fun without, you know, that level of success. It's just, it's such a fun time of the year. And if we're able to kind of get plus EV bets to enjoy it and maybe make a little bit of money, like what, what beats that, right? Big bomb. Thank you for tuning in to 90 Degrees, presented by the Hammer Betting Network. Head over to our website, thehammer.bet, for all your sports betting needs. If you've enjoyed the show, click that like button. If you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. If you made it this far, drop a comment on your favorite promo bet. Let's cash.